Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. This is Raymond, your host. Well, come in, won't you? Yes, how are your spirits this evening? Oh, I'm glad to hear that. Our spirits are fine, too. Would you like to see them? Oh, it's no trouble at all. Now, um, which would you care to see first? The spirit or the body? Oh, well, the body is right over there on the floor. And the spirit is right next to it. Oh. Oh, you can't see it. I forgot to tell you, you have to be one in order to see one. <laughs> Shall we get started? Well, naturally. Now, uh, turn out the lights. No, no, you won't see any ghosts in the dark, but <laughs> they'll be able to see you. <laughs> Far from town, there are a group of three hills. On the summit of the highest of them is the Cruz estate, owned by two brothers, Arthur and Carl. At this moment, Carl and his wife, Lucille, are digging a hole at the entrance of the estate, planting young poplar trees. Carl, I think it's deep enough. Oh, I think we ought to go a little deeper down. Oh, here comes Spears. Spears? You're digging? Yes, we're going to plant a whole row of Lombardy poplars. Mm -hmm. You you mean right here? Yep. We're going to line both sides of the road. Well, perhaps you'd better let me do it. I'm your caretaker. I should do the gardening. Spears, you look upset. What's the matter? Well, where you're digging is an old Indian burial spot. There's a curse on it. Oh, don't worry about it, Spears. You don't believe it? Of course not. Lucille and I don't go in for superstition. Yes, but it's no superstition, sir. It's a... You hit a rock. Uh Uh-huh. Oh, I, that sounds like a rock. It's a little hollow. Dig it up, whatever it is. Yeah. Whoa. Oh, it's a skull. Yes, a skull. Well, Spears is right. This place must have been an old Indian burial oh, ground. Please put it back. No, I'll keep it. Carl, perhaps you'd better put it oh, back. No. Please, please bury it again, Mr. Cruz. It will bring bad luck to all of us. No, Spears, that's just a silly, silly superstition. Well, uh, what about the rest of the skeleton? Well, well there doesn't... There doesn't seem to be one. No. Just a skull. Uh, uh, you bring it into the house, will you, Spears? Oh, no, uh, I'd rather not. All right, I'll take it in myself. But don't either of you mention this to my brother, Arthur. He's terribly scared of things like this, and he's just gotten over his nervous breakdown. Carl, perhaps you should put the skull back. Well, Lucille, you're not being taken in by this hokum about curses, are you? Oh, that that sounded like my wife, Mary. She was cleaning the windows. Good heavens. She fell out of the window. Mary. 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 Well, she's unconscious. Please do something. You must do something. I'm afraid there's nothing we can do, Spears. She hit her head against a rock. She's dead. How oh, Spears? He's quieted down. I can't understand it. There's only one rock underneath the window, and Mary hit that. That one rock. There isn't even a pebble around for yards. Well, don't go imagining things again, Arthur. Spears kept talking about a curse. Spears believes in pixies and gremlins, too, don't forget. Well, I feel rather funny about it all. Oh, Carl, maybe you'd better switch some more lamps on. This living room feels gloomy. Oh, let's cut this nonsense out. Wait. You hear anything? Oh? No, I don't. Yes. I think it's coming from the ceiling. What's coming from the ceiling? I don't hear... What is it? It must be the beams. I sometimes do that from the heat. It's not the beams. It's too regular a sound. What room is directly above us? It's it's an old bedroom. We use it as a storeroom now. It hasn't been open in years. There's something up there. Well, of course there is. A lot of old things from years back, Lucille. Did you put the skull in the score of door? Yes. Yes, I did. What are you two whispering of... 
They're coming down the stairs. We'll take a look and settle this. So far. <laughs> look at your feet, Carl. The skull. How, how did it get down here? It came down the steps. Seems to be looking up at us. A skull. How, how did it get into the house? Carl found it while digging. Spears said it belonged to some Indian. Spears was right. There is a curse on the house. We'll all be killed. I'm leaving. I can't stand it. Well, Carl, what are you going to do with the skull? Well, lock it up in the closet. Lock it. Carl, you'd better bury it again. No, I... I can't do that, Lucille. If I do, it means... I believe in all this tummy rot about ghosts. Well, then suppose you tell me how a skull could open a door and then come bouncing down the steps. I don't know. Maybe someone's playing a trick on us, dear. What happened to Mary was no trick, Carl. Nor is this, and you know it. Well, whatever it is, I'm not going to bury it. We'll keep it locked up in the closet. Oh, Mr. Cruz. Uh, Yes. What is it, Spears? Well, it isn't my place to tell you, sir, but I... You're referring to the skull, aren't you? Yes, sir. Well, it won't bother us anymore. The whole thing's some queer trick. I've got it safely hidden in this closet. I'm putting a lock on the outside. But the lock isn't going to do any good, sir. It will break through the door, just like the last time. I don't think anything like that can happen again. I'm the only one that has a key to this lock. If the skull wants to break out, you'll have to come to me for the key. How are you feeling, Arthur? I'll never feel right in this house again. Oh, nonsense. Why don't you put a light on? Arthur, it's, it's morbid sitting here in the dark by yourself. We're all going to die. Don't be ridiculous, Arthur. Where is the skull? Where it can't get out. Tomorrow I'll take it into town and let the police look at it. Tomorrow will be too late. Look, I, I'm getting tired of this. You've got to get hold of yourself, Arthur. You, you'll go completely to pieces. You think I'm a coward, don't you? Oh, Arthur, no. Well, you're not a coward. You're just a victim of your own exaggerated imagination. Wait. There's someone at the door. I'll open it. Who is it? I... I don't know. No one came in. Something came in. For heaven's sake, put the light on. The skull. I... I can't believe it. You can't believe it. (laughs) There it is. Grinning at you from the floor, but you can't believe it. You don't believe in these things. I, I, I put a lock on the door. Locks aren't going to help. Nothing is going to help. We're all going to die. It's uh, it's an hour later now. Arthur has gotten over his hysteria, but he is still terrified. I'm not going to spend another night in this house, Carl. But, Arthur, there's got to be some logical explanation. I'm not in the least bit curious. I just want to get out of here tonight. I'm going to go with him, Carl. Lucille. Well, perhaps we'll bury it again. We'll put it back in the same place we found it. That won't do any good. It's too late now. Don't be ridiculous. If it wants anything at all, it wants to get buried again. I'm sure all this mysterious business will come to an end as soon as we bury it. The house won't ever be the same. Oh, stop it. Both of you. You're acting like a couple of scared children. We'll put the skull back where we found it and and we won't be bothered by it anymore. Spears! Spears! Uh, Yes, Mr. Cruz? This... this skull. Let's take it out and bury it in the same place where we found it. I'm glad you reconsidered, sir. It's the only way. I don't seem to remember the spot. Well, it's on the other side, sir, right near the entrance road. Oh, yes. Yes, sir. Here it is. But the hole we dug, it's not here. I I filled it in, sir. Oh, well, we'd better dig it up. 
Yes, sir. If you'll hold the skull, I'll dig it open. We might as well do it right. I know exactly how deep it was. If you don't mind, Miss Cruz, I'd rather not touch the skull. All right. Yeah. Yeah, that's about right. There. Now we'll put the thing back. Well, it... It doesn't seem to want to go back. Oh, I just missed dropping it into the hole. Uh, hold the fly side down here. Yes, sir. Well, that does it. Oh, I hope we'll have no more trouble. Well, Carl, did you bury it? Yes, same place. That's all. Forget about it, shall we? Maybe it's easy for you, Carl. But I won't forget about it for a long time. Neither will I. I'll be having nightmares about it for months. I don't know what's gotten into you, Lucille. You were never easily frightened. I'm not. But skulls that roll by themselves give me a funny feeling. Mm. Well, uh, look, come on, let's play cards, huh? Hearts? We don't need more than three hands to play. We'll forget the whole crazy business, huh? Okay? Well, I might as well. All right, deal the cards. Yeah. Well, we're getting back to normalcy, huh? Arthur, pass your card. That wind came up suddenly. Who's first? You are, I see. Oh, all right. Uh, nine of diamonds. Your go, Arthur. Come on, Arthur, throw a card. I think I hear something. Of course you do. The wind. No, I... I thought I heard a rapping sound. Look, just pay attention to the game and stop listening for sounds. Here's my card. You threw a club, diamonds, the suit. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Oh, Arthur. Did you hear that? What was that? It's only the wind blowing the shutter. Oh, come on, let's play. Throw a card, Arthur. There's someone at the door. It isn't the wind. Someone's outside. All right, I'll open the door. No. No, don't open it. Please, Lucille. Sitting here frightened isn't going to do us any good. We've got to open the door. Don't open it, Carl. Who is it, Carl? What? It, it was it, nothing. It's just the wind. You're lying. Your face is white as a sheet. I know. It's the skull. It's come back. I, I tell you, it's nothing. It, it was just the wind. Nobody was there. I'll see for myself. <laughs> Oh, Mrs. Cruz, I I didn't hear you knock. I didn't. I want to talk to you, Spears. Uh, yes, Mrs. Cruz, but it, it's rather late. You've been up late before. Oh, yes, but it, it's just that I'm tired tonight. I, I don't mean to be rude. You've been doing a lot of night work? What are you referring to, Mrs. Cruz? Spears, you don't really believe in skulls that move around by themselves, do you? Well, I... I warned your husband about it. It's a curse. Is it part of a curse for a skull to use a trowel to unbury itself? Your trowel? My trowel? Oh, you're mistaken. <laughs> no, I'm not. I just came from there. Why would I want to do anything like that? Mm -hmm. Why? That's why I'm here. I'd like to know why. Please, Mrs. Cruz, I I'm tired. We'll talk about it in the morning. We'll talk about it now, Spears, right now. Get out of my room. All right. I'm going straight to the police. I've got the trowel. We'll see if the skull left any fingerprints. You won't do that, Mrs. Cruz. Oh, yes, I will. All right, Spears, just sit right where you are or I'll shoot. Oh, please. Put the gun down. Start talking. Well, it, it, it's all a mistake. If you don't start talking, I'll shoot. In self-defense. Did you dig up that skull? Well, I, I... Did you... Yes. Yes, I did. And you rolled the skull down the steps. The first night it was in this house, didn't you? Well, it was only a joke. I... And you also managed to open the closet. Yes, but I... Whose skull is it? I don't know. You're lying. That skull has something to do with you. I checked up on it. Your first wife disappeared. Perhaps the police can identify the skull. Oh, please, don't go to the police. I... Well, it was my first wife, Jane. I, I killed her. 
I didn't want your husband to bring the skull to the police, so I tried to scare all of you away from here as the safest measure. Go on. Yes. Wait a minute. Who rolled the skull into Arthur's room? It wasn't me. It must That's have been... That's right. It was me. Perhaps you and I can work things out. I tried to frighten my dear brother-in-law Arthur away so that I can have complete ownership of the entire estate. You see, Arthur is leaving tonight. Yeah. Perhaps we can help each other. No one has to know of our little conversation. No one is going to know. Well, now that we've both accomplished our purpose, maybe it would be the best thing to bury the skull again. Yes. We'll do it now. Well, here we are. Let's hurry. They'll miss me if I'm out here too long. Perhaps we'd better dig another hole. Oh, it doesn't matter. Will you hold the skull? No. I... I'd rather not. You haven't suddenly gotten squeamish, have you, Mrs. Cruz? Put the skull in the ground and dig that hole. Oh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> What's the matter? The skull. Look at it. What about it? It's moving. Can't you see? Well, it, it, it is just the wind pushing Hurry it. Hurry up. There. Yes. There. It's deep enough now. Hand me the skull. Oh, I no. forgot. You, you won't touch it. All right, I'll get it myself. What's the matter? My hand. I can't get my hand out. The jaws clamp you... down. Your hand. Please. Help me. You've got to help me. Do something. You've got to do something. It, it won't let go. I can't. Oh, please, Jane. Jane, darling. I didn't mean to kill you. You're my wife. I, I didn't mean it. It was an accident. Please believe me. I, I'll do anything. Anything. Oh, no. No, Jane. No. Oh. How is she, Carl? Oh, Arthur, it's pretty bad. The doctor says it's hopeless. There's nothing more I can do. Her hair, Arthur. It's turned completely white. She's just out of her mind. Horrible. Spears died this morning. He never recovered consciousness. Died of fright. Everything else seems to make sense, but I... I don't understand how the skull could have clamped its jaws on his hand. When he picked it up, he must have picked it up upside down. The lower jaw, which swings on a hinge, came down. He was so frightened that his hand froze to the skull. Spears was just frightened to death. I want that skull. Yes, sir, I want it as a knocker for the inner sanctum door. Good night. Pleasant dreams. <laughs> well, uh, thank you very much, friend Raymond. Your sense of humor is really quite refreshing. That is, in a ghoulish sort of way. <laughs> we'll be trying your creaking door again soon for some more laughs. Well, right now, let's look in on the green room where the players are rehearsing the next performance in the Mystery Playhouse. Follow me, please. Come. Say, Dexter, how's it feel to be both a spy-catching hero and a prospective bridegroom at the same time? At the moment, it feels like being the 13th sardine in a tin built for 12. Well, the doghouse is always like this. Hey, huh? finish your story, Stanley, about Dexter reporting the German agent that, uh, what's his name? Quartz. Quartz, yeah. Well, Dexter here figures that Quartz is up to something, so he tips off the FBI. Yeah. Hey, hey, you guys, take a look at that gal in the black dress. <laughs> That's fine talk for a guy who's about to get married. Well, go on, Stanley. <laughs> Dexter's only trying to change the subject. Well... Following up Dexter's tip, the federal men trapped Quartz. Uh -huh. That was six weeks ago. 
So today, in three minutes, in fact, Quartz is going to get quite a shock. Quite a shock. You mean they're going to... That's right. At six o'clock, that'll be less than three minutes now, Quartz is being electrocuted. You ought to read the newspapers, Lieutenant, and find out about things. Well, when you've just got back from the canal zone, you're likely to neglect the newspapers for the first few days. Hey, the gal behind us. <laughs> What'd you say, Dexter? The gal behind us. One in the black dress. Oh. Mob's too thick. I can't even turn around to get a look at her. Hey, go on, Stanley. What was this Quartz after? Plans of a new type mortar, wasn't it, Dexter? Mortar? Oh, I, I can't say. Oh, don't be such a clam. But it's taboo, I tell you. Well, don't get sore about it. Oh, who's sore? Come on, come on. Let's get out of this mob and find some less crowded joint, huh? Oh, take it easy. Let's have at least one drink here, and now we finally got to the bar. <laughs> <laughs> Ouch! Who? What the heck? Well, what's the matter, Dexter? Somebody step on your corns? Oh, no, it felt like someone stuck a needle in my hand, but... The way I'm wedged in here, I can't even lift my hand to see. <laughs> Probably a pen scratched you. With all these women about. Hey, Dexter. According to the clock on the wall there, Quartz is being executed right this second. I'll say, it's kind of close in here. Let's get out and get some fresh air. Take a look in the mirror over the bar, Stanley. That woman behind me. Oh, oh. That's what Dexter's been muttering about. The brunette in black. Smooth. Hey, do you know her? What makes you think I know her? Well, I thought she nodded at you. Just my natural good looks. <laughs> I never saw her before in my life. It's uh, kind of close in here. Let's get out. I can hardly breathe. Oh, stop clowning, Dexter. Quit leaning on me. What's eating, Dexter? Just because he's going to be married. In three days. <laughs> you shouldn't have mentioned marriage, Stanley. From the way he's leaning on me, he must have fainted. <laughs> That's altar <all> fright. <laughs> Come on, Dexter. Take your weight off him. Of all I can do to take care of myself and this. Say, Stanley. He has painted or something. No kidding. Oh, Dexter's a practical joke. No, this isn't a joke. He's all gray about the lips. Huh? Look at him. I mean, hold him. He's falling. Oh, Dexter. <laughs> Dexter. Dexter, what's the matter? Dexter. Hey, what's the matter? Lieutenant, is he all right? What's the matter with him? Give him some air. Is he all right? No. He isn't. I... I think he's dead. Well, it's impossible. Uh, is, is there a doctor here? Uh, open his collar or something. Just don't let him lay there. Come on. Oh, over here, Doc. Back up, please. Let the doctor through. Lieutenant, what on earth's happened? Where's the doctor? Maybe he can tell us. Hey, Dr. Rauber here. Dr. Rau. Here, let's have a look. Oh. Help me turn this man over. Sure. There. Looks like he's been suffocated. Doctor. Is he dead? Oh, yes, he's dead all right. Oh, he can't be. Only a minute ago, he, he was standing here talking with us. He said something about somebody sticking a needle in his hand. What's that piece of black paper on the back of his right hand? Yeah, what? Don't touch it. Don't touch it. Hmm. It's thin black cardboard. Perfect circle, about a quarter of an inch in diameter. With a tiny hole in the exact center. Hmm. There's a small puncture in the skin on the back of the right hand. Right over the place where this circular piece of cardboard was. A drop of blood caused the cardboard to adhere to his hand. Somebody better call the police. The police? Why? Because it looks as if your friend here has been murdered. But Dexter oh, couldn't have been murdered. I was standing right beside him all the time. No one's to leave. Everybody stay right where you are. And you over there, call the police department and ask for homicide. <laughs> I'm Detective Sergeant Locke. Are you the doctor who called headquarters? Yes, that's right. Who's the guy on the floor? What happened to him? Willard Dexter. As to what happened to him, we don't know. What do you mean you don't know? Who was nearest Dexter at the time? Well, the lieutenant and I were with him. That's and right. I was behind him, and so was this lady. Oh, you were, huh? How about that lady? Yes, I guess that's right. Okay, then I want to take you two ladies, and you, lieutenant, and you, mister, aside for questioning. We'll go in this office here. Oh, and Doc, uh, would you come along too, please? Well, of course, Sergeant. All right, just step in. All right, Blondie, you too. Oh, I can't. I got a date in ten minutes. Go I'm on, coming. get in there. Am I arrested? Are you up? Look, Blondie, you will be in just about one second if you don't get in there. Oh, all right, but don't call me Blondie. Hey, Duggan, don't let anyone in here. Right. Now, we'll get a little privacy. Uh, Lieutenant, let's have your story first. Well, we were standing in the crowd. Your name? Lieutenant Max Lerbach. Okay, go ahead. Stanley and Dexter and I were at the bar. In what order? Order? Oh, uh, well, Dexter was on the right. I was in the middle, and Stanley was on the left. All right, go on. Dexter said that someone stuck a needle in his hand. And suddenly he went limp and fell to the floor. Sergeant, 
On the back of his right hand, I found this little black cardboard disc. Yeah. Under the disc is a small wound, and I've made a study of poisons. I believe that this man, Dexter, was poisoned. Poisoned? Yes. There's a poison which, taken internally, may do no harm at all. But the smallest bit introduced directly into the bloodstream causes almost immediate paralysis of the nerves which control the breathing. What poison? Curare. Huh? There's a trace of what seems to be Curare on the underside of that black cardboard disc. Then you'll think he was murdered? It appears probable. Your idea, Doctor, is that someone jabbed a poison-coated needle into Dexter's hand? A minute or so before he collapsed. Now, where would a guy get this stuff? Well, certainly not from the average drugstore. Curare is made by the South American Indians. It's a very rare in this country. Say, Stanley, did you notice? Dexter died at the same time Quartz was executed. Say, I hadn't thought What's of that? that? The spy who was electrocuted? Yes, Sergeant. Dexter was the clerk in the Army Ordnance Department who suspected Quartz and tipped off the FBI. Yeah? It couldn't have been a coincidence that they both died at practically the same minute. You don't suppose... The I don't agent... suppose anything yet. Hey, Sarge. Photo and fingerprint boys are here. Right with you, Duggan. Now, everyone, just sit tight a minute. Say, that's a rather unusual way to kill somebody, don't you think? I wonder if that police sergeant is right, and the killer really is one of those four people. Well, it's too bad our time is all up, or we could stay around and find out. I'm afraid you'll have to wait until next time when we present the entire story of Death in the Doghouse. This is Sergeant X, closing the doors of the Mystery Playhouse. Good night. Sleep tight. so generally admired that it has attained the stature of a first-class virtue. Well, the fellow whom you're about to meet while, while hardly falling into the virtuous category, he does have a sense of humor. <laughs> Things like murder or hate and madness or, or someone telling him his mother just died <laughs> practically rolls him in the aisles. He loves a good, ghoulish joke. Oh, and he loves to tell them, too. He's about to start one now. So follow me, please, to the inner sanctum and your host, Raymond. <laughs> Evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. Now, come in, won't you? This is your host, Raymond, again, disturbing the peace. Say, have you ever, ever had the screaming memes? Did you ever get an attack of the yelling and wailing jitters? You walk in your sleep? Do you ever wake in the middle of the night shrieking at the top of your lungs? Oh, you do? Well, you must be an awfully hard person to live with. Well, friends. 
friends, it's time for our story to begin. From this point on, forget everything pleasant. Get a finger ready to chew on, turn the lights down low, and listen to Peter Lorre tell you the blood-curdling tale, Death is a Joker. Come with me to the criminal courts building. A tense hush falls upon the spectators as Charles Luther takes the stand. Gentlemen of the jury, I'm accused of murder. I'm an actor, a comedian. Look at my face. Ugly, huh? Yes, so ugly that whoever looks at it laughs. I'm not telling you this to win sympathy for myself. I, I tell you this because it is important to your understanding. The strange events... It brought me to this courtroom today to plead for my life. Shortly before midnight of November 28th, I went to the apartment of my friend Robert Langwell, the famous actor in Mass Me Charles, well, this is a surprise. Come in, come in. Thank you. Would you like a drink? No, don't bother. I don't want anything. No? Well, here, may I take your thing? Mm. Oh, excuse me. Hello. Oh, George. Yes, I have the money for you. You'll be up? When? 20 minutes? Yes. Bye. George Galvin. You know him, Charles? Yes. Rotten actor. But an excellent poker player. So I have heard. Mm. Robert. Robert, before leaving the theater tonight, someone told me that you and Julie Winthrop are going to be married. Who? Yes, we'll be married in two weeks, right after my wife gets a decree in Reno. You must not marry Julie. Not marry Julie? Well, who are you to tell me what I can do? I know Julie well, and uh, I also know you. That's why you must not marry her. Charles, it might be better for you to mind your own business. Julie and I are in love with each other. No, you're not. She's fascinated by your good looks. She, she's impressed by your fame, but she, she does not love you. Now, look here. We may be old friends, but I've stood all I'm going to. I... Oh, wait a moment. I get it now. You're in love with her yourself. I? I in love with Julie? No, we we are just friends. Friends? <laughs> You're madly in love with her. That's why you came here tonight, isn't it? No. <laughs> friends. Stop your laughing. You in love with a girl like Julie? <laughs> why should my love make you laugh? Oh, so you admit it, huh? All right, I do. Why is it so funny? Do you think she'd have you? You, a, a clown, ugly, clumsy. <laughs> you in love with Julie? <laughs> and why not? Why not? You! Stop your laughing. Stop it. Can I? Look at yourself. Charles, let go of me. No. You're choking. Let go. A joke, huh? A joke. Laugh. Go ahead. Laugh now. Laugh. Robert. Robert. I didn't mean it. Robert. Good Lord, what have I done? rushed out of his apartment, trembling. I turned my coat color up to hide my face. The streets were crowded with people coming from the late movies and restaurants. I tried to make myself act naturally, but it was impossible. Everyone I saw, every pair of eyes that looked at me seemed to accuse me of my crime. Get I stopped. Morning waited for the light to change. Paper, mister. Morning paper. Read about the Reynolds execution. Here, let me have one. There you are. I, I, I didn't know Reynolds was to be executed tonight. Yeah. They burned him. Well, he deserved it. Murdering his friend like he did. Oh, wait a minute, mister. You forgot your chain. Oh, never mind, never mind. <laughs> I looked at the newspaper I'd bought. There was a photograph of Reynolds on the first page. In his face, I saw my future. Those shattered hopes. 
the torture of the trial, the horrible, nerve-wracking experience of waiting for death. I flung the paper away. I went to the window. I opened it. I looked down 17 stores to the ground. <laughs> How tiny people look. The automobile lights move like so many fireflies. I climb out on the edge. I braced my arms. I took a deep breath. One last look. I closed my eyes and... I hesitated a moment. I decided to answer it. I closed the window, went to the door. Hello, Charles. Julie. Why did you rush away from the theater tonight? I was anxious to talk to you. Talk to me about, about what? Uh, I need your advice, Charles. What's wrong? Well, it's Robert. What happened? Well, nothing happened. It, it's just that I'm not sure I love him. I'm not sure? Yes, when I'm with him, everything seems all right. He's mm. handsome and charming, but when I'm alone, I begin to wonder and to doubt. Why? Can't you guess why? Yes. You, you love someone else? Yes. Well, who is it? You. Me? Yes, that's what I came here to tell you. That's why I don't want to marry him. Mm. Yes, I would have told you before, but I was so afraid of making a fool of myself. Mm. You didn't seem to care. I didn't care. Julie, this is crazy. I loved you from the moment I saw you. You loved me? Yes. But, darling, why didn't you tell me? I'll tell you? How could I? You, you're too young. You're so beautiful. And I look at me. Ugly, clumsy. How could I speak to you? Fools you both were. How you look means nothing to me. Nothing? Of course not, darling. How lucky we are we found out in time. In time? <laughs> in time? Oh, merciful heavens. What a joke. <laughs> what a joke. Charles, what's wrong? Oh, what a joke. There's tears streaming down your face. <laughs> Charles, you're hysterical. Now stop it. 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 Julia, something you must know. Yes, sir. Tonight I committed a murder. Murder? What are you talking about? I killed Robert. Killed Robert? Oh, out of your mind. You don't know what you're saying. But is it true? I went to his apartment and we quarreled and I killed him. Oh, no. You told me a moment ago that you loved me. Do you still love me? Yes, Charles. And, and tell me what to do, Julie. Help me. I, I, I can't think. I, I don't know where to turn, but... What can I do, Julie? What can I do? <laughs> Pull yourself together, Charles. This may not be as hopeless as you think. Why? Was Robert alone in the apartment when you called? Yes. Were you seen entering or leaving? No. Are you sure? Yes, his apartment is on the second floor. I, I walked up and down. What time did you get there? Shortly before midnight. And what did you do before that? Went to a movie. Movie? How long did you stay there? Oh, only about 20 minutes. Do you have the ticket stuff? Huh? Yes, here it is. Oh, do you realize what this means? They, they may never find out about you. Never find out? That's right. They won't suspect you since they can't know your motive. No one saw you enter or leave, and you have an excellent alibi. Motive? Alibi, Julie, do you realize what we are doing? We are talking of this as, as if we planned this crime as, as though we were criminals. But I committed a crime, yes, but I'm no criminal. I... I didn't mean to do it. I know, darling, I know. You can think of your own life now. Oh, and mine. Yes, Julia. Oh, I see what you mean. 
I'm not a criminal, but I'm afraid to roll for criminal now. A subtle, clever criminal who is cunning enough to escape punishment. Can I do it? Can I do it, Julie? Charles, listen to me. We must find out how much the police know. If it's hopeless and they have found out about you, then it would be best to give yourself up. But let's not make any decisions until we know. But how can we know? Did Robert expect anyone tonight? Yes, George Galvin phoned while I was there. He said he'd be up in about 20 minutes. Then the body must have been discovered by now. Yes, I'm, I'm sure the police must be there by this time. I think that I'll go to Robert's apartment. No, Julie, no, no. I, I didn't want you to become involved. I'm already involved. Went for me, this horrible thing would never have happened. The least I can do is to help you now. But Julie... Promise, promise me you'll not leave this apartment, Charles. All right. I won't be long. Julie. Yes. If, if something happens, if, if something goes wrong and is separated before you return, I, I want you to know that I don't know what to say, Julie. You don't have to say it, darling. I know what you mean. Goodbye. I have to think like one, to act like one, have to be one. What question would be asked? Where were you at 12 o'clock that night of November 28th? Uh, I was in a movie. I'm busy. She is the sub. No, no. No, they, they can see immediately that I'm lying. My voice must not tremble. I... I shouldn't be so quick with the answer. Where were you at 12 midnight of November 28th? Where was I? Let me see. Well, I... I left the theater and I went to a movie. It was a very amusing picture. <laughs> very amusing. Can you prove what you say? Prove? Well, I don't know. I, I, it would be difficult, I... Well, I may have to pick it up somewhere. Yes, here. <laughs> Let me show it to you. Here it is. Did you ever quarrel with Robert Langwell? Quarrel with... We were friends. We played in many shows together. We were on the best of terms. That's all, Mr. Luther. You may leave now. Yes. I can plead. It is possible. I can escape punishment. Police. Can it be the Police. Maybe it is Julie. Good evening, Charles. George Gill. I know it's rather late for an unexpected visit. Yes, it is. But this is important, Charles. A matter of uh, life and death, you might say. What do you mean? Have you a cigarette? Huh? Yes, here. Thanks. Well, what's the matter, Charles? Your hand's trembling. <laughs> it's nothing. You don't seem to be your usual self this evening. No quips, no jokes. What's wrong? I don't always feel like joking. Yes, Charles, it's strange about human nature, isn't it? Who would have ever dreamed that tonight, a few minutes before midnight, you entered Robert Langwell's apartment, quarreled with him over Julie, and choked him to death? What are you talking about? Uh, you're an excellent actor, Charles. But you're wasting your talents on me. Save them for the footlights. Or the police. Police? Will you please tell me what all this is about? Still acting, hmm? Now look, Charles. You killed Robert shortly before midnight tonight. You are mistaken. <laughs> I was in a movie at that time. Oh, so that's your alibi. Very clever. Now, Charles, either we discuss terms now or I go to the police. Wait! How did you find out? That is my secret. What do you want? Money. All you have on hand. All you can dig up. All right. Come with me. I I have some money in the bedroom. All right. Uh, just a moment. What is the business? Yes. What is... Why? I'm taking no chances. Let's go. All right. Well? Where's the money? Charles, stand back or I'll fire. Stand back. No! Let go of my hand. Let go. I'll twist it out. We should kill that gun points to your head. There. There. Charles, let go of my hand. 
You don't know what you're doing. Go on, go on. Fire now. The bullet will enter your brain. Fire! Charles! Fire! Charles, don't! I'll make you fire! I'll squeeze your fingers! Charles, let go! Go on! This is all a joke! I'll make you! Stop it! Charles! Um, uh, uh. Just a second. Just a second. Charles. Darling. Darling, there's nothing more to worry about. Everything's all right now. We can be married and go on living and never fear anything. What makes you say that? Darling, you didn't commit a crime at all. What do you mean? Robert's alive. Alive? Yes, he's downstairs now paying the taxi. Robert? Alive? Yes. I spoke to him about the marriage, and he was wonderful about the whole thing. Darling, aren't you happy? The worries are all over. You can smile and be gay. That must be Robert now. Hello, Charles. Robert. I thought you were... Well, I'm not. But, but how did you... You see, I fainted. George Galvin came in and brought me to. George Galvin. Did you tell George Galvin what happened? Yes, I did. Look here, Charles. As I told Julie, I'm willing to forget the whole thing if you are. Forget? Forget? Yes. It might have ended tragically, you know, but thinking it over, I realize I'm as much to blame as you are. So if you're willing to shake hands. Shake hands? See you now, darling. There's nothing more to worry about. I feel so happy I could... Charles, what's the matter with you? It's... It's nothing. <laughs> it's nothing. <laughs> it's nothing! <laughs> I became a criminal well, because I thought I had committed a crime and I had to think like a criminal. <laughs> My motives were those of all men. I wanted happiness and wanted marriage to the woman I loved. What would you have done in my place? And I still think I know that guy. <laughs> I wish I could place him. Well, it must be wonderful to have a sense of humor, but I don't think Charlie feels much like laughing. Do you? We'll pay a return visit to the inner sanctum and its fun-loving host, Raymond, soon, but don't go, please. Not until we drop in at the green room, where the players are rehearsing our next performance in the mystery playhouse. Come with me, please. Come, come. <laughs> Change the dressings at midnight, and again in the morning, nurse. Yes, doctor. Well, doctor, what did you find? Will I be blind? Is it very bad? Now, now, take it easy, Mr. Denton. There's nothing to worry about. Nothing at all. You... You're sure? You aren't just saying that. I'm quite sure. Valerie. Valerie, did you hear that? I... I'm not going to be blind. Valerie? Valerie, where are you? Right here, darling. Did you hear... I won't be blind. Isn't that wonderful? Yes, darling, it's marvelous. You... You don't sound very excited. Valerie, don't you realize I'm going to see again? She doesn't sound excited because I don't want you to be excited, Mr. Denton. You've got to relax. Try to sleep. Sleep? With this ungodly pain? My eyes feel as though they were on fire. That will stop the as soon as the opiate I gave you takes hold, you'll be comfortable, I'm sure. Now, good night. You're going now, Doctor? Yes, I'll... I'll look in on... on your husband in the morning. 
Stephen. Yes, Valerie? Do you mind if I step out into the corridor for a moment? But you you promised not to leave me. I, I'm afraid, Valerie. Everything's so dark, I... The nurse will be here, dear, if you want anything. I just want to ask Dr. Wade some questions. Questions? But he's already told us... That yes, we... Stephen, I know. But I'd like to find out about the treatment and how I'm to take care of you when we get you home, you know. Just little things. All right. But, but hurry back. I, I want you near me. I will, dear. So good night, Mr. Denton. Good night, Doctor. And thank you. You're quite welcome. After you, Mrs. Denton. Thank you. I suggest we step into the consultation room across the hall. We'll have more privacy. All right. Here we are. Thank you. Well, it's been a long time, Valerie. Yes, Paul, it has. Almost ten years, isn't it? About that. Strange that you should have called me, of all people, to treat your husband's eyes. Oh, I, I was panicky, Paul. I didn't know what to do. It all happened so suddenly. Stephen was working in his laboratory at the house when suddenly I heard a violent explosion. I ran in and found him clutching his eyes and screaming, I'm blind. First thing I thought of was an ambulance. Then you... Why didn't you think of me ten years ago? It's not fair, Paul. Is it fair to turn your back on me and then to marry a man almost twice your age? Paul, please, why bring up ancient history? It isn't ancient history to me. I've never forgotten you. Paul, about Stephen's eyes. What about them? I have a feeling that you weren't telling him the truth. You're right. Oh, you mean... He's not going to regain his sight. He's going to be blind. Oh, Paul. You don't expect me to be to be terribly concerned, do you, Valerie? After all, he did take you away from me. Don't be vindictive, Paul. It wasn't Stephen's fault. He didn't even know of your existence. And you never told him that we were on the point of being married? No, never. <laughs> it's rather ironic that we should meet again at the bedside of my rival. Your husband. A man who may forever walk in darkness. Don't say that, Paul. It's horrible. But unfortunately true. A moment ago, you told me not to be vindictive. I'm not, really. But if I were, I could have my fill of vengeance if I told him about us. And then told him that he'll be blind forever. You wouldn't, Paul. Or I might take another form of revenge. I could tell you that an operation is called for. A very delicate operation. Are you trying to say that there might be a chance? Yes. But supposing I refuse to perform the operation? Paul, you're joking. You can't mean that. Perhaps not. But you call me vindictive. Suppose I operate and my scalpel slips. What if he dies? That would be murder. You're not a murderer, Paul. You wouldn't risk your professional reputation. Why must you torment me this way? You really love him, don't you? Yes, I do. Then forget the things that I've been saying. I want you to think of me as a friend. I want you to trust me. I do trust you, Paul. Thank you. Now as to the possibility of surgery. Here is the situation. The transparent film over your husband's eyes, the corneas, were burned and torn with the explosion. They've been so damaged the blindness will result, even though the eyes heal. But you think an operation would cure that? Possibly, although it's a very delicate job. The injured cornea must be peeled away and replaced by a fresh, healthy one. Where can you get healthy corneas? From the eyes of the dead. Oh. It isn't quite as horrible as it sounds, Valerie. You know, dying peace, people often will their eyes for just this purpose. We maintain what we call a corneal bank. It's much the same as a blood bank, only but there's this difference. 
corneal tissue can't be stored more than 48 hours. It must be fresh, or it's no good. You have some available in the bank? No, that's the trouble. I'm afraid we haven't. But there's got to be some, Paul. I don't know where, Valerie. Unless... Unless what? I was just thinking. Last night, one of the interns asked me to look at a charity case that puzzled him. The patient is a Hindu or a Persian named Chandra. He lives in a dirty little shack near the waterfront. Yes, Paul? I stopped by and examined him. I found an incurable condition. There's no way to save him. He won't live more than a day or two, but his eyes are healthy. You mean, you think he might... I don't know. You'd have to have his consent, of course. Take me to him, Paul. I'm sure I can make him understand. Oh, it may not be so easy, Valerie. He's a strange person. A mystic and a spiritualist. Let me try. Just take me to him. All right. We can go there now. Doesn't the doctor sound familiar to you? Huh? <laughs> That's right. It's Boris Karloff, up to his old tricks. I think it might amuse you to be on hand for our next performance. When we present Mr. Karloff and Creeps by Night. This is Peter Lorre closing the doors of the Mystery Playhouse. Good night. Sleep tight. to the squeaking door of the inner sanctum. For those of you who write in to find out why our door squeaks so much, I guess now is a good time as any to explain that the hinges are rusty with dry blood. Through that door pass the most beautiful ghouls in the world. Won't you come in? <laughs> <laughs> dark old houses or murky graveyards to feel the chilly presence of beings from the other world. Uh, last week, just after I completed my broadcast, I was called to the telephone. When I picked up the receiver, I heard... Hello, is that you, Raymond? Yes. Are you going to be at home tonight? Uh, yes, why do you ask? Because I'm going to drop by. There's something I want to ask you about. Try to be alone. Uh, who are you? Don't you remember me? Well, the voice is familiar, but I can't quite place it. I'm Gideon Blake. I'll see you later, Ray. Goodbye. Now, there's nothing unusual about a call like that, except one thing. Ten years ago, my friend Gideon Blake was killed. I was sure that call was some joke. I remember laughing about it as I sat down in my living room with sandwich and glass of milk. But uh, later that night, I must have dozed off. I remember being awakened by the tower clock chiming. It was midnight. Somewhere a cat howled against the moaning wind that had sprung up. Strange chills and a shudder through my battered front door must have blown open. I went to see. Standing there was 
Good evening, Blake. Good evening, Raymond. Blake. You shouldn't be so surprised. I told you I was coming. Yes. You've changed so. It's been a long time. More than ten years, I believe. But I... I don't understand. You were burned to death. How on earth did you come back? There are many things which you will never understand while you're alive and on this earth. Why have you come here? To give you this piece of paper. Hmm? What's on it? The names of four persons. They are alive now. In a short time, they will all be dead. I looked at him carefully as he talked. He looked hideous, ugly, with horrible burns on his face. The man had to look. Touch the very smell of death. Good night, Raymond. I looked at the slip of paper my friend Gideon had given me. There were four names. Stella Marno. Robert Lane. Amelia Cardway. Raymond Edward Johnson. The first three names I didn't know. The last was very familiar to me. It was my own name. No, thanks. What about that piece of paper I gave you? How'd you get it? I told you. Look, I'm a cop, Raymond. When I believe a story like that one, you can call the little men in the white coat. Oh. No, I'm sorry I bothered you, Inspector. Let's forget it. <laughs> I can't forget it. Why? Because Blake wrote that note. Are you sure? We checked the handwriting. It's his. So are the fingerprints we found on it. How do you figure it? I don't yet. I am waiting for you I to told tell you everything... Hey, wait a minute. Hmm? Maybe Blake's really alive. He got burned to death ten years ago. Are you sure? Positive. We checked every angle of his death at that time because we thought he might have been murdered. Murdered? I never heard about that. Oh, Blake was with the department. You remember? Working on a homicide case. The Laura Wilcox case, you remember? Oh, uh, vaguely. We figured someone might have polished him off, but nobody did. It was an accident. Was this Wilcox murder ever solved? Well, uh, no. Maybe those names I gave you had something to do with the Wilcox case. Why don't you check them? I did. None of your names figure. These people never heard of the Wilcox murder. Hey, Inspector. Yeah, what do you want, Gibson? Hey, weren't you interested in some information about a dame named Stella Marlowe? Yeah. She was the first name on that list you gave me, Ray. Hmm. Uh, what about her? I just came through on the ticker. Stella Marlowe was found dead. Murdered. <laughs> I just got in. I've been down to the police library setting the file on the Wilcox case. All right, forget about that. Now listen, I want you to lock your door and all the windows. I'm sending down a red-headed cop to guard you. What? Don't let any dark-haired guy into your house, even if he's your own best friend. What's this all about? We're dealing with a homicidal maniac. The body of Stella Marlowe was dismembered. Dismembered? Tell my man to call me at headquarters when he arrives. Goodbye. Goodbye. After I hung up the phone, I noticed the little black box on the living room table. How it got there, I don't know, because my house was locked all day. I undid the black ribbon, opened it. What I saw inside fascinated and horrified me. It was a human hand. Suddenly a thought clicked in my mind. I recognized something on the hand. Inspector, this is Ray Johnson. Yeah, what is it? Did you ever find out what happened to Stella Wilcox? Huh? She's the stepdaughter of the murdered Laura Wilcox. Why do you want to know? Well, she was suspected of the murder for a time. Listen, and... will you drop that angle? Will you just answer one or two questions? Did the killer dismember the whole body in the Stella Marlowe murder? Just the hands. Why? Did he have on a large diamond ring the third finger on the left hand? Yes. The friends say she wore it all the time, but how did... I've got it here. 
someone sent me a hand with a ring on it. What? And get this. There's a name engraved inside the ring. The name is Laura Wilcox. What? There's a scar on the thumb. There was a scar on the left thumb of Stella Wilcox's print in your file. I took a fingerprint. The prints on the hand and the fingerprints of Stella Wilcox are identical. Are you sure? Yes. Stella Marlowe and Stella Wilcox are the same person. Did you find anything else there? Yes. Black hair and the fingernails. I'm coming down to your place as fast as I can get there. Goodbye. Goodbye. The front door slammed the second after I hung up. I turned around. Coming toward me was a man with jet black hair. You know, I can say sudden horrible death when it happens to other people, but when it happened to me... Well, the man with the jet black hair looked quietly at me and said, I'm Robert Lane. You're Raymond Edward Johnson, I believe? Yes. Inspector Bell spoke to me about you. Can I sit down? What do you make of all this? I don't know what to make of it. You heard what happened to Stella Marlowe? Yes. Did you know that's not her real name? Yes, she was the stepdaughter of Laura Wilcox, but... Uh, How do you know? I think I know more about this than you imagine. Is your name really Robert Lane? Why? There was a chauffeur in the Wilcox home, a man named Lowry. I wonder if... There's no harm in telling you now. Yeah, I'm that chauffeur. And Amelia Cardway? She was Mrs. Wilcox's maid. Now, Johnson, the murder of Stella didn't come exactly as a surprise to me. Why? She poisoned her stepmother with the help of the maid, Amelia Cardway. But why am I involved in all this? Not fool each other. Somehow you discovered that Stella murdered her stepmother. But after ten years, you can't dig up any evidence, and you know it. So you invent this wild story about Gideon Blake. Just the right sort of psychological scare to frighten the two women into making a move that'll give them away. Very clever. Just a moment. What color is the hair of Amelia Cardway? Blonde. Pretty shade of blonde, in fact. Very attractive girl ten years ago. Oh, what's in the box? I advise you not to look. I rarely follow the advice of other people. I... Oh. Where'd you get this? Someone left it here this evening. That ring. Old lady Wilcox gave that to Stella on her 18th birthday. That... The hand of Stella. I understand why you asked about the hair, Johnson. That hair under the fingernails is black. Just like mine. Mm Mm-hmm. I wouldn't be surprised if an analysis showed that it was mine. And you killed it. The point is that I don't intend to give up my life to amuse you and your little crime hobby. What do you mean? You're going to learn about crime, Raymond, through a direct personal experience. I'm going to kill you. Don't call me. I... He was a powerful man. His blow dazed me. I struck my head against the furniture. I lay down the floor dazed. Like... A slow motion picture, I saw Lane approach and lean over me. A long knife in his hand. You didn't expect to stir up this hornet's nest, did you? Crime and murder is very amusing, isn't it? Well, you'll find out just how funny it is. I don't raise his arm. I was powerless. He was driving the knife down. Suddenly... Uh Scream. Somewhere the door slammed. And I blacked out. Here, here get up, right? Mm-hmm. There you are. You're okay now. Huh? Come on, get up, get up. Inspector uh, Doyle. Hey, what happened here? We found you on the floor, out like a light. There was Lane, the Wilcox chauffeur. He tried to kill me. Lane? Lane's dead. There's the body. Huh? Did uh, you kill him, Ray? No. Where does Amelia Cardway live? Oh. A few miles from here, why? We've got to get over there right away. She killed the old lady, and she might have killed Stella, too. I don't see how Amelia Cardway could have done it. Maybe you'll tell me next that Gideon Blake did it. I don't know. Gideon Blake didn't have a hair on his head. Oh, besides, he's dead. I never arrest a dead man for the crime of murder. 
can't get confessions out of him. Perhaps Lane did go to see Stella shortly before she was killed. They were all in this together. Yeah. They told you they didn't know each other to protect themselves. Now, that still doesn't explain how the hand got to your place or why Gideon Blake came back from the dead. Or why we found those black hairs under the fingernails. Yeah, I've got an idea about the hand. Yeah? I think it was dismembered so that you would never know that Stella Marlowe was Stella Wilcox. Huh? She changed her appearance, but she couldn't change her fingerprints. Well, then, who left it at your place, and why? And why should you be on the murder list? Don't remind me of that, please. Well, here's Amelia Cartway's cottage. Maybe we'll get some of the answers here. Come on. Ah! What? Inspector. Help! You hear that? Yeah, yeah. Come on, follow me, right? Inspector Doyle had his gun out and was running into the house. I followed a few steps behind. In a moment, I was in the living room. Doyle was standing there. Right. Well, what happened? Why did you scream for help? In an old chair sat what was once an attractive woman. The blonde hair was streaked with gray, but the face was a mask of terror. I recognized her from the picture in the police file. It was the former maid of Laura Wilcox. Amelia Conway. Yes, Mrs. Wilcox, in just a minute. Come in, Mrs. Wilcox. What's the matter with oh, her? Yeah, she's cracked or delirious. Uh, Just keep sitting there like that. Bum, bum. You can't live with secrets. Someone will find out. I'm glad. Glad they found out. Now she'll never come to see me again, ever. Yeah, well, who came to see you? Mrs. Wilcox. Huh? I didn't want to give her that medicine. I knew it was poison, but Stella made me. She made me. And so did me, the chauffeur. Getting out of the chair, Inspector. Uh, Look, there's a knife in her back. Miss Cardwell. There she is, at the top of the stairs. Mr. Wilcox. Where? At the top of the stairs, Inspector. Look, it's Laura Wilcox. I'll tell everything, Mrs. Wilcox. We were all in on it together. Stella, the chauffeur, and me. I didn't want to do it. Forgive me for... I'm going upstairs. You look after her, right? The moment he reached the bottom steps, Mrs. Wilcox disappeared. I stooped over the cartway woman. She was dead. The first pistol fire came from the upstairs part of the house. A moment later, Inspector Doyle came tumbling down the stairs, the gun still in his hand. He was unconscious. I looked up. At the top of the stairs stood Mrs. Laura Wilcox. She said nothing, but calmly came down holding the poker she had struck the inspector with. She bent down, took out the knife from the body of the dead Amelia Cartway. I was too startled, too frightened to move. Suddenly the woman took off her hat, her wig, and there stood Gideon Blake. You'd better go now, Raymond. I don't understand that disguise. Look there. The entrance to the dining room. Fire. Yes. Fire. You best leave at once. Those flames are spreading rapidly. Take Inspector Doyle with you. Great. Hurry. Yours is the last name on my list, you know. He didn't have to say any more. I dragged the inspector through the door. Gideon Blake turned, smiled at me. And walked directly into the plane. That was the last I ever saw. Of I found the missing pieces of the jigsaw puzzle. Mm -hmm. Laura Wilcox was a twin sister of Gideon Blake. We uh, dug up the birth records. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's why she looked so familiar. And that's why he murdered the three people. Because they killed his sister. He faked his own death in order to carry out justice himself. Yes, but that uh, still doesn't explain why I was brought into it. Uh -huh. a bit. <laughs> That's simple. He wanted us to know what was going on so that we didn't hold some innocent person. Mm -hmm. uh, just one more question. Yeah, go ahead. How did Blake fake his own death ten years ago? Uh, well, uh, now, we don't know exactly, mm -hmm. but he, he must have done it. Uh, did you find his body in the ashes of Amelia Cardway's cottage? Hmm? Mm, well, I guess they're there, but, uh, well, it's impossible to identify them positively. Yeah, that leaves one other explanation. What's that? 
that Gideon Blake actually died ten years ago. A uh, word of advice, naturally. When you get killed, don't let your murderer slice your hands off. Because then you can never put the finger on it. <laughs> Good night. Pleasant dreams. Uh. Friends of the inner sanctum. This is your host, Raymond, inviting you in through the squeaking door. Well, it's so nice of you to come here tonight and uh, help me sit up with the corpse. Hey, such dull company, so cold and stiff, bored with being dead. All the uh, life seems to have gone out of him. What? You say you've seen him before. Oh, no, he's not that horror man who plays in pictures. But he does look like him. So much so, in fact, you might even call him a dead ringer. (laughs) Tonight's Inner Sanctum Mystery, Voice on the Wire, is an original radio drama by Robert Sloan and stars Miss Leslie Woods in the role of Geraldine Reeves. It's produced under the direction of Hyman Brown. Use cold gate tooth powder, keep smiling just right. Use it each morning and use it at night. Don't take a chance with your romance. Use cold gate tooth powder. Romance. What is romance? Romance is the light on the path of love. But a light so delicate that even a breath may put it out. Even a breath. You'd hate that to happen to you, wouldn't you? Well, don't let a breath of trouble ruin your romance. Don't let unpleasing breath offend the one you love. I tell you what. Brush your teeth night and morning and before every date with Colgate tooth powder. Because scientific tests have definitely proved that in seven cases out of ten, Colgate tooth powder instantly stops unpleasing breath that originates in the mouth. And let me add, Colgate tooth powder is the only tooth powder that offers proof of this fact. And then, too, Colgate tooth powder cleans your teeth beautifully. No amount of money can buy you a dentifrice that will clean your teeth more quickly and thoroughly. Remember the name Colgate tooth powder with the accent on powder. Don't take a chance with your romance. Use Colgate tooth powder. No doubt the telephone is an ingenious invention, but um, as far as I know, no one as yet has been able to commit murder over it, although many people have wanted to. <laughs> Still, there are worse things you can get on the phone than the wrong number, especially if you happen to call the voice on the wire. On a long, narrow island just off the shore of one of our larger lakes... Mrs. Geraldine Reeves, widow of the late composer David Reeves, lives alone in a gaunt, gray, shingled house. Only a few hundred yards away are the charred remains of her former home where David was burned to death in a fire just two years ago. It's after dinner now, and as the clock in the hall strikes eight... You've got to get hold of yourself, Geraldine. I can't help it, Doctor. You see, it starts every night about this time. What starts? The music. David's last composition. I hear it being played on a piano. And the notes seem to come from the old house, the house where David died in the fire. Well, perhaps someone is playing that piece on the piano. Someone on the island. No. No, there's only one other house out here, and those people are away. And the dog. The dog keeps howling all night long. What dog? I don't know. 
There's no dog on the island, but David and I did have a dog. You remember? He stayed with David the night of the fire. He died with him because David was too ill to get out of bed. There. There it is again. It's amazing. That's a real dog. Somewhere on this island. Oh. Do, do you think so? I... Why, of course. Probably some stray got across the bridge or swam over from the shore. Well, you see, I... Oh, excuse me, Doctor. Certainly. Hello? Hello. Mrs. Geraldine Reeves. Yes, speaking. Who is this? Listen. Good heavens! You have four hours to live, Mrs. Reeves. Four hours to live. What? What did you say? Hello! Hello! Oh, what's the matter, Geraldine? The music. The same music. I heard it again. What? Over the phone. Someone's playing it on the piano. It must be some sort of a prank. No, no, no. A man spoke to me. He said I have four hours to live. Four hours to... Here. Let me have that phone. No, no. It's, it's no use. He's rung off. Well, I... we might be able to trace the call. Hello, operator. Operator. Somebody's trying to kill me. Hello, operator. Operator. What's wrong, doctor? I... I'm afraid the wires have been cut. We'd better get into my car and drive into town right away. Yes. Yes, it isn't safe for me to stay here another minute. understand it. The motor won't turn over. Somebody must have meddled with this car while we were in the house. Well, try my car, Doctor. I think perhaps I'd better. Is it in the garage? Yes, yes, I'll... Great heavens, it's gone. The garage is empty. The car's been stolen. Now, let's not lose our heads, Geraldine. But... We're not completely cut off yet. We can't use a car. We can still walk. But it's almost a mile to the bridge, and the road is so dark down along the water. It won't be too dark with a flashlight. We can go down through the woods to the edge of the water and walk along the shore. Oh, wait a minute. What's the matter? I just remembered. David's brother's driving out here tonight. Harvey? Yes, and his wife, Laura. They said they'd be here by 8.30, and if we wait for them, they can take us back in their car. What do you think, Doctor? That's safer than trying to make it alone. If we wait right here, perhaps we can watch the bridge and see them coming. For heaven's sake, Geraldine. What are you staring at? The bridge, Doctor. The bridge, Look! This end of it's been washed out. Oh, Doctor, this is crazy, searching for a telephone wire in back of the house. If we're seen out here, there's no telling what might happen. Please, please, Geraldine. We've got to find out where that wire was cut and splice it together again. It's our only chance of reaching the police. But it's almost nine o'clock. We've wasted an hour already. If I'm not out of here by twelve... Stop it, Geraldine. We... Stop it. Sorry, I, 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 I didn't mean to. I... What's that? It's the dog again. That confounded dog is tied up around here somewhere. No, no, I didn't mean that. I meant the light on the road. There's a strange light on the road. The headlight of a car coming this way. A car? Yes. Quick, behind the house and stay out of sight. It's turning into the driveway. How could a car have come out onto the island with that bridge on? Shh. They're getting out. And, and Laura. Good heaven. Oh, Harvey. Hello. Harvey. Well, oh, Harvey. For Pete's I... sake. Oh. Jerry, what are you doing? Playing hide and seek with us back there? Oh, Harvey, I'm so glad you came. Jerry, oh, what's I, the I, matter? I, oh, everything, everything. But, but first you've got to tell us how you got here. Why, well, we just drove over the bridge and on up the road the way we always do. But how could you drive over the bridge? It's been washed out. What? Well, I saw it with my own eyes, and Dr. Pricing saw it too, didn't you, Doctor? I certainly did. Oh, you must be mistaken. We drove over the bridge not more than two minutes ago. Are you sure you haven't been on the island longer than that? Well, I'm positive. Why? Well, some very strange things have been happening here tonight. Geraldine's life was threatened, her car stolen, and mine tampered with. What? What are you talking about? Look, I'll show you. The starter in my car won't even turn the motor over. Here. Why, George, it's working now. Say, what is this, Jerry? Have you and the doctor been taking a few pills? 
Since you drink too much wine at dinner. Oh, no, no. Everything you said is true. Even the telephone wires have been... I, I, I must be going out of my mind. That is my telephone ringing, isn't it? Yes, of course. Well, aren't you going to answer it? Well, I, I'm almost afraid to. Come with me, Harvey, will you, while I do? Sure. Hello? Hello. Mrs. Reeves. Yes? Listen. It's nine o'clock, Mrs. Reeves. You have three hours to live. Waiting, this endless waiting. Why don't the police come? Easy now, Jerry. They'll be here. You only phoned them a few minutes ago. But something can happen before they get here. I have a gun ready, just in case anything should happen. And I won't hesitate to use it. You have a gun, Doctor? Why, uh, yes. Uh, Geraldine gave it to me before you arrived. Oh. What's the matter? You trust me with a gun, don't you? Why, why of course. I'm... Laura. What is it? A face at the window. I just saw a face at the window. Laura, please, you're letting your imagination run away with you. No, I saw it right there. It was the face of a, a dead man. Quick, Harvey, out the back way. Right. No, no, please don't leave us. We'll be right outside the window. Jerry, I'm afraid. Well, there's nothing we can do, Laura. They, they won't be far away. But I... I don't trust Dr. Prizing. You never should have given him that gun. Why not? Because... Because I think he's a murderer. Oh, huh? yes. Don't you remember how he acted at the trial? When you were accused of starting the fire that killed David? He testified against you time and again. Subtly. To make them think you did it. Because he started that fire himself. What on earth are you saying? I'm telling you the truth. During the trial, he swore that he wasn't on the island the night of the fire. But he was. And I can prove it. How? By this cigarette case of his. Here, look at it. You see how it's charred and melted on the side where his initials were? He must have left it in the fire that night, by mistake. But he couldn't have. The police searched everything the next morning. They would have found it in the ashes. Not if it wasn't there. He came back for it that same night, as soon as he missed it, and dragged it out of the fire. He knew it would incriminate him if it were found in his possession, so he threw it into the lake as he drove home over the bridge. And that's where we found it, in the water, the last time we were out here. Oh, Laura, I hope you're wrong. I... So do I. But if I'm right, we're all in for... Laura! The lights! Somebody's cut off the lights! <laughs> Laura! Laura, where are you? Carry the door! Carry through the door! It's the face I saw! Uh, uh, Laura! Laura! <laughs> Whoever came through that door intended to kill me. Jerry, please. How is Laura, Doctor? I'm afraid I can't do anything for her, Harvey. She's passed on. Oh! Laura. Laura, darling. You'd better not touch the body, Harvey. Oh, leave me alone. You've done enough already, Dr. Prising. I beg your pardon? You'll have a lot of explaining to do when the police arrive, Doctor. I'll tell them how you ran away from me out there before the lights went out. And how you were here in this room when they went on again. Harvey. Don't say things you'll regret later on. Just a moment. Where is the cigarette case Laura had in her hand when the lights went out? What cigarette case? You know the one I mean, Dr. Prising. The gold one that was charred in the fire. I haven't the faintest idea what you're talking about. I have. And if you're as innocent as you claim to be, you won't mind being searched. Not at all. Go right ahead. I will. Whom are you calling, Geraldine? The police. I can't understand why they haven't arrived yet. It's almost 10 o'clock. Maybe something's happened to them on the way. Maybe their car broke down. Their car, too? Huh? Nothing. Only it seems as if your car is the only one that works when you want it to. Headquarters. Oh, Sergeant. Sergeant, I can't understand why your men aren't here yet. A murder's been committed. Do you think you've been calling the police department all this time, Mrs. Reeves? <laughs> It's music. It's ten o'clock, Mrs. Reeves. You have two more hours. Oh, no. 
He said he wanted to see if he could find the dog. Oh, well, there's someone in there. I'm going to find out who it is. Be careful, Harvey. He may be standing just outside the door. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. You stay behind me. Is anybody there? Is anybody in the living room? No. There doesn't seem to Don't be... Don't talk about me, Harvey. Oh. Well, Dr. Pricey. You've been standing at this door with your ear to the keyhole? No, not exactly. I thought you were supposed to be outside, looking for that dog. I was outside for a while. But I saw someone moving around in here, so I came back. And I got here. Your wife's body was gone. What? what? Gone? Your... Laura's body is gone? I assume that it's gone. It's not where it was on the floor. For the... But how could... It... Look here, Pricey. You were alone in this room. And so were you. What? After I left. Wasn't it, Geraldine? Well, yes, now that I think back, he was. Certainly. What's more, Geraldine saw me leave the house. And when I left, the body was still here. After that, I don't know what happened. What are you driving at? Draw your own conclusions. I've drawn mine. Why, you... Harvey, stop it! Stop it! I... I'm sorry, Jerry. I just... The dog again. Yeah. Now, I can't understand why you didn't find that dog, Dr. Prising. He must be right out there where the old house used to be. Well, if you think you can find him, why don't you go? Good heavens, man. What? Look. There's a fire burning out there. On the grounds of the old house. Pricing, you started that fire yourself and you're burning Laura's body in it to cover up your crime. Harvey, where are you going? I'm going to the fire, Jerry. I've got to stop it. I've got to put it off. I'm going to lose my mind if someone doesn't stop these awful things from happening. Won't anybody help us? Easy, I... Geraldine. I'm... The man who hopes to kill you was trying to break you down first. It's well... part of his plan. Here. Take a sip of this brandy. It'll help you. All right, thank you, Doctor. I... What's the matter? Oh, nothing, really. I just don't care for any brandy just now. What's wrong with it? Well, I, I, I didn't say anything was wrong with it. I, I just don't... You fool. Do you think I'm trying to poison you? I don't know what to think. Here. Give me that brandy. I'll drink it myself. <coughs> there. Believe me now? I don't believe anyone. Listen to me, Geraldine. I'm the best friend you have in the world right now. You've got to understand that. Because there isn't much more time. We've got to get away from Harvey while he's still out there. What do you mean? Can't you see? He's trying to kill you. That's a lie. It isn't, Geraldine. Harvey's the one that's lied to us. He and Laura both. They intended to kill you when the lights went out. But in the darkness, Harvey made a fatal mistake. He thought it was you he was strangling, not Laura. I won't believe it's that. It's the truth. They never drove across that bridge at 9 o'clock tonight. They've been here on the island all evening. How do you know? Because we saw that bridge with our own eyes. And I saw it again just five minutes ago. It's still down. You're lying. Come out and see it for yourself. You're just trying to get me out of this house. Stop being such a fool. Here. Take this gun. If it'll give you any security, take it. And hold it in my back while we're out there. But for heaven's sakes, let's get away from Harvey while there's still a chance. All right. Give me the gun. Here. Now, you keep in front of me all the time. And I'm warning you. If you make one false move, I'll kill you in cold blood. You see? Harvey and Laura were lying to us. The bridge is still down. You're right. They couldn't have come across that bridge. Of course not. The only trouble is, we can't get back over it now either. We've got to get away, Doctor. Now, before we're seen... 
What about that house at the other end of the island? People are away. But they might have a boat. Yes, of course they do have a boat. We can row to the mainland. Come on, quick. All right. I have a feeling we're being followed. It's your imagination. Hurry, Geraldine. Hurry. We are being followed, Doctor. Look behind us. There's a man with a dog. Good heavens. It's just like the dog you owned. The one that died in the fire. Yes. And the man... It's Dave. We've lost them. Lost them in the woods. They can't be far behind. It doesn't matter now. The house is just ahead. But the boat, Doctor. The boat's not at the landing. It must be. Well, it isn't. Can't you see it isn't? Perhaps it's around and back. No, that side of the house faces the road. Then we'll have to break in and hide here until morning. Our best chance is to be inside. Where we can protect ourselves. After all, you still have a gun. But I hardly know how to use it. Then give it to me. No. You still don't trust me, do you? I don't know, Doctor. But I'm the one who's been threatened, so I really should have the gun. Very well. Wait here. I'll break through the window and come around on the inside. Did you hurt yourself? No. I'm all right. Uh, just wait there for me and I'll unlock the door. Oh, hurry, Doctor. Please, hurry. They're on our trail again. Come inside, Geraldine. Quickly. And lock the door behind you. What's wrong, Doctor? Nothing's wrong. We're in luck. There's a phone here. If it hasn't been disconnected. Hello. Hello, operator. This isn't the operator. Tell Mrs. Reeves it's 11 o'clock. She has one more hour to live. Half past 11. I won't leave this house. I'm not going to run away any longer. If they're going to kill me, let them come here and do it. Only for heaven's sakes, why don't they do it right away? Why don't they come here and get it over with instead of waiting until 12 o'clock? Uh, Geraldine, please. Well, I can't stand it any longer. I'd rather die than go through any more of this torture. Uh, I just... Uh, sit down for a moment. Relax. And try to ease your mind. Oh, for... Dr. Prizing, what are you doing? Playing the piano. I thought it might relax you. But that melody... You... You're the one I hear at night, playing David's music. Playing it right here in this house. Yes, Geraldine. I've rented this house to protect you from David and the dog. Well, stop it! Stop playing that piece! Stop it! Now stay where you are. Stay... Don't, don't be afraid. I won't harm you. As long as you have that gun. But the gun won't stop David. David's dead. Is he? Listen. He's right outside the door. And in a moment, he'll be here to take you with him. No! Everything you've done. Stop! You killed me, didn't you, darling? You started that fire because you knew I was too much of an invalid to get out of bed. Stay where you are! You hated me, Geraldine. Stop! No. Your bullets can't harm me now. Nothing you can do can harm me. Because I'm dead and you're still alive. Oh, David. David, forgive me. I, I didn't know what I was doing that night. Please, please believe me. I was sorry as soon as I started that fire, but it was too late then. I couldn't put it out. I, I couldn't. How dare you? How dare you ask my forgiveness when you're still lying? But I'm not lying. I'm not. I, I told you everything. Why didn't you tell the police? Because I wanted to live. You'll confess everything now? Yes, David. Yes, yes, I will. If you'll only leave me alone, please. Please. It was my cigarette case Laura found in the water. I'd thrown it over the bridge that same night after I took it out of the fire. Well, I, I guess that's all we need, Harvey. Full confession with two witnesses. Harvey! Yes, Geraldine. 
I do look like my brother in this dim light. And the dog Laura's holding outside is the same breed as the one you own. Laura! Laura! Did you say Laura was alive? Very much so, Geraldine. It wasn't hard for me to pretend being dead. With the doctor keeping you away from my body. Then you were all in this together. You forced this confession out of me. Yes, Geraldine. The blank cartridges Dr. Pricing slipped into that gun of yours really turned the trick. Oh, excuse me. Hello. Oh, hello, Inspector. Yes, it's all right now. You can hook the wires up again. She's told us the truth. And you'd better get to work on that bridge right away. It's uh, still down. <laughs> What an outrage, all those opportunities for murder and not a drop of blood spilled all night long. Oh, well, some days you can't lay away a corpuscle. And now, uh, a moment while our Colgate voices bring you a message. Use Colgate tooth powder, keep smiling just right. Use it each morning. And use it at night To help you rate With every date Use Colgate tooth powder Tell me, do you really mean it when you say, I want to be alone? Or are you just pretending that you don't care about dates? Could it be that a little breath of trouble has cooled your romance? A little breath? What a pity to let unpleasing breath ruin your romance. Why not brush your teeth night and morning and before every date with Colgate Tooth Powder? Scientific tests prove that Colgate Tooth Powder, in seven cases out of ten, instantly stops unpleasing breath that originates in the mouth. So use Colgate Tooth Powder for all it's worth. Enjoy its exciting cleansing results, too. No amount of money can buy you a dentifrice that will clean your teeth more quickly or effectively than Colgate Tooth Powder. Remember the name, Colgate Tooth Powder, with the accent on powder. Don't take a chance with your romance. Use Colgate Tooth Powder. Well, it's time for me to join the moonbeams now. But before I leave under a cloud, before I'm missed, I thought I might pass on the moral of tonight's story. If you must light a fire under your husband's bed, be careful where you drop the ashes. By the way, this month's Inner Sanctum Mystery novel is Puzzle for Puppets by Patrick Quentin. Well, now it's really time to close that there squeaking door until next week when Colgate Tooth Powder brings you another Inner Sanctum Mystery. So until then... Good night. Pleasant dreams. Good evening, friends. This is Raymond, your host. Welcome again to the Inner Sanctum. Come in, won't you? You'll have to excuse me for not getting up, but I have an awfully stiff neck. You see, I was out with a certain lady last night who collects very curious things. She spent the first half of the evening telling me how wonderful I am, but after that... Well, it's one thing when a girl tries to turn your head... It's another when she tries to twist it off. <laughs> and now, friends, let me introduce someone who is a real lady. She must be a lady because she wants to reform me. Uh, come in, Mary Bennett. Hello, folks. Drop a coffin and sit down, Mary. Now, Mr. Raymond, please don't talk that way. It is nice. Why are you always pretending to be so cold-hearted and creepy? 
Underneath, I'm sure you're a friendly, good-natured sort of man. <laughs> yes, you are. Underneath, you're just like everybody else. I'll bet you like to come home in the evening, put on an old jacket and slippers, and then sit down to supper. Yes, sir, and I'll bet I know one of your favorite dishes, too. Noodle soup. Well, most all men like noodle soup. That's why Lipton's is so popular. Lipton's noodle soup is real homemade tasting. It's got a grand chickeny flavor, and it's swimming with noodles. Egg noodles, too. You know, Lipton's noodle soup will bring a family swarming to the table quicker than a dinner bell. Mr. Raymond, someday I'm going to take you home with me and feed you a good hot bowl of Lipton's noodle soup. Oh, well, thanks for the invitation, Mary. And uh, now let me invite you to come to the desert and hear the story of Desert Death. It's an original tale written by that spinner of surprise stories, Robert Newman. And our star tonight is Horace Braham. <laughs> desert, eerie and mysterious at sundown, the sun sinking slowly in a purple haze, the cactus casting long and weirdly twisting shadows, the hot wind still, the silence overall. Driving fast, a dusty car comes down the narrow desert road. At the wheel is Dan Darrell, a rancher. Next to him is his Indian friend, Toby Priest. <laughs> Still worrying, Toby? Stop teasing me, Dan. You know I never did worry. I just told you what my people used to think it meant. Used to think? Didn't you say we ought to postpone our trip into town today? I did. And when did you say it? Right after you saw them. Three vultures lying together toward the sunset. That means three days. A bad omen for a journey. <laughs> hey... Look, I see him. What's a man doing out here in the middle of nowhere on foot? Anything the matter, stranger? Need any help? You're very kind. Our car broke down and, well, we were in a bit of a spot. Didn't know whether anyone would be likely to come along here or not. I, We? Oh, I, I didn't see your friends. Well, come in. We're going to Palo Verde. We're glad to take you that far. Well, that's very decent of you. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, my name is Darrell, Dan Darrell. And this is Toby Priest. Well, I'm very happy to know you. I'm Richards. And this is Brennan and Smith. How do you do? Howdy. Uh, you're British, ain't you? Why, yes. <laughs> Clever of you to spot it. We're on our way out to the coast. One of those hush hush missions. That's why it's so important we get into town. Oh, sure, sure. Uh, which way'd you come? Medicine Creek or Route 12? Why, uh, uh, Medicine Creek. It sounded more scenic. You're lying, Dan. You know that, don't you? What makes you say that? Toby, use your head. He doesn't look. Mr. Darrell, surely it's considered rude to whisper in front of strangers, even here in America. Isn't it? What? Oh, uh, sorry. Yes, I'm sure you will be. But first, I must insist on knowing what you were saying. Insist? What do you mean, insist? This is my car, and this is a... I know. A free country. But this is a gun. That's why I can insist. And now, will you tell me what you were saying? I was saying it, so I'll tell you. I said you were lying, that you weren't British at all. No. Then who are we? I think that you're Nazi prisoners who escaped from that camp up near Post City. Oh? Uh, and what makes you think that? First, none of your clothes fit you, so they're obviously not yours. Second, you said your car broke down, but there wasn't any car around. Third, you said you came by way of Medicine Creek, and that road's closed. All right. Stop the car and let us get it over with. You mean shoot them? Uh, not so quick, Benner. We can use them for a while yet. At least one of them. What the devil do you mean? Of course, your Indian friend is right. Very clever, too. But since I have a gun, you will take orders from me. Our first need is water. You have any in the car? No. And then we will have to find some. Yeah? Where'd you expect to find water in the desert? I told you we were Nazis, Darrell. I did not tell you that we were Ronald's men from the Africa Corps. 
That means we know the desert, any desert, better than anyone on Earth. Those hills off there to the left, take the left-hand road at that fork there and head toward them. But do as I say. How much further you want me to go up this... this wagon track? Slow up. Isn't that a... Yes. It's a shack right next to the cliff. Stop. Ah, looks deserted, but... There, next to it. Is that not a well? It should be. Renner, go see if there's any water in it. Double all, Herr Colonel. You two come with us. We'll go look at the shack. What is this place? Those terraces up there on the cliff? A pueblo. Cliff dwellings. Centuries ago, my people lived in villages like this. There is water in it, Herr Colonel. Even a bucket to get it up with. Good. Come into the house. Match, Schmidt. Hmm. From the dust, I'd say no one had been here for a good many years. Prospector's cabin, wasn't it? Probably. That means... Ah, that's what I want. Shovel. What do you want that for? Want to dig yourself a grave? Yes, sir. Exactly. But not for me. Huh? What you mean? Precisely what I said. Sit down. Make yourselves comfortable and I will explain things to you. I'll stand if you don't mind. Oh, not at all. We Nazis are very objective, analytical people. We decided we needed a car to make our escape in. Now we have one. We also decided we needed someone to drive the car and get us safely across the border. That means we can use one of you. The other one will die. You... you wouldn't dare. My dear Darrow, outside of the thousands of men we killed in North Africa who don't count, we killed at least two guards in making our escape. Do you really think one more death means anything to us? The only question is, which of you shall die? This one here. He talks too much. Well, that's not quite fair, Brenner. He's just, shall we say, less stoical than the Indian. On the other hand, I think that in the long run, he would probably prove easier to handle, less dangerous. That means that the Indian dies. What? Why, you... Shut up, you... Uh, (coughs) Thank you, Brenner. Schmidt, take the gun, the shovel, and our Indian friend, and watch over him while he digs his grave. Hmm. Very nice. Very nice indeed. Of course, I personally would prefer a deeper grave, but that's up to you. The depth is not important. The only thing that matters is that it faces west. That is why I dug it with the head against the cliff. An old tribal custom. Very interesting. Similar to the Egyptians. But of course, they believed in a life after death. My people believe in a life after death also, Colonel. And in this case, I think I can promise that I will not rest easy in my grave. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Hear this too, men from across the seas. Men with death in your hearts. For the evil you would do... Evil will follow you like a hungry wolf. What is that? What he just mentioned. A wolf. Though you bury me deep, the earth will not hide me till you have paid for your crimes. Here where you have killed, here too will you die. Now, Herr Colonel. Yes, Brenner. Oh, you can't, you... Very good, Schmidt. I'll take the gun now. Fill in the grave, then meet us back at the cabin. Ooh, what a place. It's worth in Quetara. I wish you'd sit down, Darrell, and stop staring out of the window. You're worried about your friend. I bought him very nicely. I'm not worried about him. I'm thinking about what he said before you killed him. I should think that you think about it, too. That? (laughs) We have had more curses laid on us in more languages than you have hairs on your head. What's that? 
Must be the wind. No. No, it is different. More like some kind of musical instrument. But there's no one around here but us. There hasn't been anyone living in those houses up on the cliff for centuries. It's just the wind, I tell you. But if you want to, go take a look. Go take a look, I said. Yeah, I will, Herr It's too dark. There's too much sand blowing to see anything. But wait! Who there near the foot of the cliff? There's something. It looks like... Leave a cop. It's the Indian. He's lying there. Out of his grave. Oh, you bury me deep. The earth will not hide me. Till you are paid for your crimes. Here were your killed. Here too will you die. <laughs> A hundred curses in a dozen different tongues. Perhaps they did mean three deaths. If so, who are the others that'll die and who'll live? Gosh, Mr. Raymond, this is exciting. What? Oh, Mary Bennett, I've overlooked you in all this desert. Uh, Tell me, Mary, whom do you hope will die, huh? Well, I don't like to see anybody killed. But those nasties sure ought to be clapped in jail. Mm -hmm. And uh, deprived of their Lipton's noodle soup, aren't they? Well, I should say. Lipton's noodle soup is much too good for fellas like them. It belongs to law-abiding folks who've got a right to sit down to a plate of homemade tasting soup. And say, that's just the kind of noodle soup you get when you use Lipton's. Lipton's is the noodle soup with the old-fashioned flavor, you know, brimming with noodles and blessed with a real chickeny taste. Yes, it takes Lipton's to show how good a noodle soup can be. Now, but... Mary, don't get so excited. Stay calm. Uh, why don't you go and perch on that tombstone over there while I go on with the story of death and the desert? I'm warning you, if I do go on, you'll be seeing strange sights and hearing strange sounds every time you put out the lights. But it's your funeral. It's uh, just a moment later now. The three Nazis are still standing at the open door of the deserted cabin, staring out into the darkness. And the colonel turns sharply, glares at death. What was that you said, Daryl? I was just repeating what Tova said before you murdered him. It's, it's true, Herr Colonel. That's what he did say. The earth will not hide me. And there he is out of his grave, lying there. Ah. Fine Nazi, you are. A fine example of the Africa Corps. Listening to the ravings of a savage and believing them. Schmidt, where did you bury the Indian? In the sand. Then this wind came along and blew the sand away. And that's all. And, and that strange means... Another trick of the wind. But if it bothers you to see him lying there, go on out and bury him again. Deeper this time. No, Herr Colonel, no. Well, that's an order. Jawohl, Herr Colonel. Frank Schmidt seems to be getting a bit uh, rattled. That's why I sent him out there. Nothing like facing a fear to overcome it. Do you not think it is about time that Schmidt came back? Hmm. He's only been gone about five or ten minutes. I told him to dig the grave deep this time. I know, but uh, I do not see him out there anywhere. Well, how could you expect to when it's so dark and when the sand is blowing like that? Maybe we'd better go out and see what's taking him so long. And uh, you too, Mr. Darrell, if you don't mind. Not at all. Schmidt! Schmidt, where are you? Probably wandered out into the desert. Schmidt! Oh, look, the Indian. He is still lying there. He, he never did bury him. That means Schmidt never even got over there. Must have lost his way right after he got outside. Schmidt! I think you can save your breath, Colonel Lowry. Right over here, the well. Huh? What are you talking about? Schmidt. Dead. Well, why are you looking at me like that, brother? Exactly as I said. He lost his way in the darkness, 
The sandstorm fell down the well. Yeah. Yeah, I... I guess that is what must have happened. As for you, Mr. Darrell, since you discovered Schmidt, you shall have the pleasure of burying your friend the Indian again. Yeah, oh, dear girl. I'm sorry. I never did appreciate the American type of humor. Now get busy with that show. May I just point out that... Well, it's easy for you to knock me down when my hands are tied. It's not so easy for me to use a shovel. Oh, I intend to untie you. But please remember always that I have a gun. And that Brenner and I have every intention of getting away from here. I'm happy to see that you've stopped facing the floor and looking out the window, Mr. Darrow. That means you've stopped expecting something miraculous to happen that will save you. Is that what you think it means? Frankly, no. In fact, I think just the opposite. You're looking much more cheerful than before. You're thinking one of them is dead. Now it'll be that much easier to get away. It really pains me to disillusion you. Schmidt was a sergeant. A fool. I can assure you that neither Brenner nor myself are going to be bothered by strange noises or tricks of the wind. Right, Brenner? Of course not, Colonel. Good. And now, if we were to make an early start, I think we should get some rest. Brenner, you take the first watch and wake me at midnight. I advise you to get some rest, too, Darrell. <laughs> Maybe you'll be able to dream of some way of escaping. Thanks. But I'm not sleeping. As you wish. Good night. What a character. He was one of the best soldiers in the Africa Corps. No? Yeah. Where's Africa Corps now? Where are you? This isn't Africa, Brenner. This is America. This is a part of America where strange things happen. Things that even the Indians can't explain. Indians. <laughs> Ignorant savages. It's that devilish music again. Where does it come from? I thought you said it was the wind. Or was it Ulrich that said that? It must be the wind. It must. Oh, you bury me deep. The earth will not hide me till you pay for your crimes. What is that? That was what Tova said just before you killed him. Schmidt was first, Brenner. You will be next. I'm waiting, Brenner. Waiting. You. Waiting. You heard that, too? Yeah. I you're, heard it. You're lying. You're lying, I say. You, you're, you're, you're just trying to frighten me. Uh, what? Who, who's trying to frighten you? What's going on? It, uh, it is nothing here, Colonel. Just that, that music again. And for a moment, it sounded as if someone was calling my name. Someone was calling your name, Brenner. The dead man. And you know you heard it. So, say it is again. You hear it? Just that same noise, the wind. Look, Wolowich, look. That Indian, he's out of his grave again. How can you tell? It's too dark to see. But I know he is. I know it. I, 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 I'm very disappointed in you, Brenner. You're losing your grip, slipping. I... Sorry, Herr Colonel. It, it's... It is just this place, the nervous tension, the mating. Just being sorry isn't enough. Fear is a weakness. As much of a weakness as pity. You know that as Nazis, we cannot tolerate either one. And you also know what you must do, don't you? No. No, Herr Colonel. No. You must face your fear and overcome it. You must go out there and prove to yourself that you are not afraid. That you've just been imagining things the way Schmidt did. But, but Schmidt... Schmidt was a fool. And he had an accident. You are an officer. And you will not have an accident. Now go ahead and convince yourself that this is all nonsense. Jawohl, Herr Colonel. But leave the gun with me. What's out there is imaginary, but Mr. Darrell is very real. If I didn't have a gun, he might get ideas. Jawohl, Herr Colonel. Here. I shall be back in a few minutes. You're looking at me very strangely, Mr. Darrell. Perhaps now you're starting to understand the fiber of the Nazi character. And perhaps now you're beginning to realize 
why you can never win this war. Because we allow nothing to defeat us or stand in our way. Any sign of weakness is ruthlessly stamped out. And... Abel, God, what's that? Sounded to me like Brenner. Outside, quick. And don't try to get away or I'll shoot you down in your tracks. Okay. Which way? Towards the cliff, where we buried the Indian. That's where he went and... What's that over there? My guess is that it's your friend, Brenner. Maybe you'd better make sure. It... It is Brenner. Dead. Strangled. So it was all imagination, huh? Just face your fear and overcome it. Aren't you feeling just a little frightened, Colonel? No. No. There's some rational explanation for everything that happened. Look. The Indian. He is out of his grave again. And that's the answer. He wasn't dead. But this should take care of him. There. And you will notice that even at a moment like this, I look ahead. One shot before and four now. That still leaves one bullet for you, if it should prove necessary. You think of everything, don't you? Yes, my friend, everything. Now get into that car. We're not going to wait until morning. We're leaving here right now. I thought you had everything figured out. You weren't frightened. What's that? What's what? That that noise, that that music. It's it's like the music we heard after we killed the Indian. I don't hear anything. Oh, but you, you must hear it. You must. Listen. It's coming from over there. For the evil you have done, evil will follow you like a hungry wolf. Though you bury me deep, the earth will not hide me till you have paid for your crimes. Did... Did you hear that? Did you hear it? Yeah. I heard it. Here where you have killed, Here, too, will you die. No. No. You're dead. You're dead, I tell you. I killed you. First Schmidt. Then Brenner. Now you. But you're dead, I tell you. And the dead don't speak. I can't be really hearing you unless... Mad. No. I can't let that happen. I can't. There's one way... The Nazi way. A way to fool you all. This is why you'll never beat us. Never. Never. (laughs) Toby. Toby. Where are you? Over here. Near the foot of the cliff. Are you all right? That first bullet creased my head. I was already dropping by the time he fired. Outside of that, I'm all right. I figured that was what had happened when Schmidt went down the well. I knew it was an accident. I was pretty happy that it was you that buried me the second time. That you put my face against the cliff, left a hole for me to breathe. The first time, well, it was pretty tough until the wind blew the sand off. Yeah, but... What about when he shot you again? That ungodly music. It wasn't me he shot that second time. It was Schmidt. I pulled his body out of the well, and I figured that in the dark, no one would be able to tell the difference. As for the music, that's why I dug the grave here. You see these holes here in that cliff? My people drilled them centuries ago. The wind blows through them. Makes weird music. This bottom hole was blocked up, but I opened it while I was digging the grave. Talking of graves... There's three of them we should be digging right now. Just one more thing I'd like to ask you, Toby. What's that? What you said this morning. Those three buzzards flying together toward the west. Does it really mean three deaths? There were three deaths. Weren't there, Dan? Never give a Nazi an even break, unless it's in the neck. As for our three visiting murderers, they may not like our sense of humor, but they can't complain about our poetic justice. 
After all, it was in the desert that they got their just... Deserts? Well, Mary Bennett, did you like the desert with its sand and wind and weird music? Would you like to live there? Well, I wouldn't mind so much. You know, I believe a woman can make a good home in some pretty out-of-the-way places, the way the old-time housewives did. But, well, I'd want to lay in a supply of good modern food, food that's easy to make, like Lipton's noodle soup. Say, that noodle soup of Lipton's would really put some cheer in the desert, wouldn't it? <laughs> yes, of course, Mary, of course. Remind me to take Lipton's with me on my next safari. We must have a word of advice. Here it is. If you should wake up one of these nights in a cold sweat... Convinced that there's something or someone in your room. And if, when you look toward the window, you should see a strange figure silhouetted in the moonlight, then pull the blankets up over your head and don't look out again. It'll be one of our three friends from tonight's story. One of the Africa corpses. By the way, this month's Inner Sanctum mystery novel is Puzzle for Puppets by Patrick Quentin. Well, now I guess it's time to close that there squeaking door until next week at this same time. So until next Tuesday night. Good night. Pleasant dreams. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> Hmm.